Welcome everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm Elizabeth, I'm Strong, and I'm currently chair of the Department of Sociology at the University of Michigan. I'd like to welcome you all to the presidential address. Um, very excited to be here today to have the opportunity to introduce Mary Bernstein, who is the president of the Society for the Study of Social Problems. So I have known Mary since late 90s when we were both finishing our graduate work and both working on LGBTQ movements. She was finishing at NYU, I was finishing at Berkeley, and um, Bethan, who was harder to tell who was working on what, you no, know, like, well, internet, really, barely at all. So it was exciting to find someone else doing similar work. And I got to know her better when we collaborated on our multi-institutional politics piece, which is in sociological theory. At that point, I was an assistant professor in Indiana, and Mary Harry moved to UConn. And at that point, I just learned you know, what a fabulous collaborator she is. And at that point, her capacious knowledge of literature like, kept me kind of reading and thinking. Um, and we really enjoyed working on that piece. And that piece um, generated lengthy phone conversations um, no Zooms in, we did all of our collaboration over email and phone, and that generated a friendship which has been sustained over the years with visits to Hartford and Ann Arbor and ASA meetings and the like. And I just want to note that just the conversations with Mary are always wide ranging, moving, moving fluidly back and forth between the personal and the intellectual ideas and um, just everything. And I just really appreciate that I can trust her absolutely, whether I'm asking her to read a paper or to offer support in hard personal situations. So, you know, one of her just most defining qualities, I think, is she just always shows up. She takes on a lot of service, community building, and does it all with good humor and excellent organizational skills. She's just a very generous citizen um, of our intellectual community, and the TSP is in great hands with her leadership. Um, she served also at UConn, where she is now um, Associate Dean of the Graduate School. She served as the Interim Department Head of Sociology, the Director of Graduate Studies, and throughout her career served a vital role in supporting junior scholars through her mentorship at UConn, um, with ASA, and with Sociologists for Women in Society, um, taking on leadership roles in all of these organizations and doing very other-oriented work, such as organizing national conferences that that provide opportunities for junior scholars to showcase their work. Um, she's a creative, rigorous, prolific scholar, working on issues in the areas of social movements, race, politics, gender, and the law, with a particular focus on LGBTQ movements and gun violence prevention. And she's a, a leader in American Social Movement Scholarship, her now classic 1997 American Journal of Sociology article on LGBT identity was one of the first articles on LGBT uh, politics published in one of sociology's top journals. This is groundbreaking and still an important article, um, now classic. So today, uh, Mary will share with us about her research on movements to prevent gun violence. And I've been talking with her about this scholarship over the last several years, and every conversation I learn more and more, and so it's a real treat that we will get to learn from her today. Um, gun violence is a topic of tremendous social relevance and about which there is far too much, uh, far too little scholarship. She has engaged in deep and immersive ethnographic research on the gun violence prevention movement in Connecticut, and um, we will really get to learn from that research today. But to hear about that, um, let's turn it over to Mary herself to hear about another damn day in America, racism and the politics of gun violence prevention. So let's um, welcome Mary and thank her for her Um, I've spent about the past seven years um, 
really immersed in the movement and trying to understand that and also really thinking about root causes and that was really the inspiration for this year's theme. Um, so what I want to talk about today is disrupting our image of what gun violence in the U.S. is, looks like, who is most affected, and how we should think about reducing the scourge of gun violence. And as Elizabeth mentioned, um, one of my favorite collaborations, I do always take a multi-institutional politics approach um, to understanding social change, social movements, and that means that I look at two things. I look at the racist in this case, the racist meaning systems or the background structures of cultural meaning as well as systemic and structural forms of domination. And these shape what we know about gun violence, the experience of gun violence, and how we respond to gun violence. Now, if I were to ask you to close your eyes for a second and to think about what image comes to mind when you think about gun violence, my guess is that you would be picturing um, images of children, whether they're small children or high schoolers, terrified, racing away from their schools with their head, hands on top of their head, escorted by police in riot gear um, to safety. The names Columbine, Sandy Hook, Parkland, Rob Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas might come to mind. Um, other horrific mass shootings might come to mind, such as Las Vegas or even the recent shooting at a Trump rally. You might also think about shootings sparked by hatred of specific groups like Pulse Nightclub that targeted the LGBTQ community, particularly Latin, Latinx folks. Um, you might think about the racist shooting at the Tops Friendly Market grocery store in Buffalo that killed 10 African Americans. The anti-Semitic shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh that killed 11. You might think about the racist killing of nine black congregants as they prayed in the Emanuel and African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015, or the killing of six Asian women and one man at Young's Asian Parlor in Atlanta, Georgia in 2021. The list goes on. You might also think about um, police killings, um, and in this I include killings such as George Floyd, who was murdered by an officer who kneeled on his neck for over nine minutes. Now, while he wasn't killed by a gun, he was killed by the threat of a gun. Um, Breonna Taylor, Alton Sterling, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Tyree Nichols, Sonia Massey just this past month to name but a few. Now, if I ask you to close your eyes and to think about your images of activists, you might think about Black Lives Matter if you were thinking about police violence, the largest and most visible movement aimed at combating police violence. Um, though most people don't think about this as gun violence, um, I would contend that police violence is gun violence, regardless of whether the victim dies of suffocation, or by an officer's gun, or by trauma experienced in the back of a police van. All of these are committed under threat of a gun. But I do think it's important to distinguish between violence committed by agents of the state and violence committed by ordinary citizens. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to focus on violence committed by ordinary citizens. In the larger, in the larger project, I talk about um, the relationship between police and black and brown communities and how that shapes gun violence and gun violence prevention activism. Some of you might also think of March for Our Lives when you think about images of gun violence prevention activists. That was organized by the teenagers um, whose school was shot um, in, uh, at Marjorie Stone, Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. You might also picture legions of mostly white moms wearing red t-shirts that proclaim moms demand action. In this talk, as I said, I'm going to limit uh, my discussion to violence committed by ordinary citizens, not by state agents. Um, and I'm going to look at and I'm going to argue that these images that we see of what constitutes gun violence prevention and what activism looks like produce an incomplete picture of, um, of both the movement and gun violence in the U.S. Jordan McMillan and I, we identify two logics of gun violence prevention activism. Organizations that um, take what we call a reformist logic target the state as they seek to alter laws and policies. This is sort of what we think of as traditional social movement activism. Um, Kristen Goss argues in her book, Disarmed, that these laws can be categorized as safe hands and safe 
guns. So safe hands means laws designed to limit who can have access to guns. These might include restrictions on minors, restrictions on having guns, restrictions on domestic abusers or felons, um, even those with mental illness. Um, although, in fact, um, people with mental illness are much more likely to be victims of gun violence than to commit gun violence. Um, safe gun laws would include making guns less lethal, such as um, banning semi-automatic style assault rifles. Those are the weapon of choice in most mass shootings. Um, banning bump stocks that have the ability to effectively convert a weapon into a fire into a machine gun, um, like the one that was used in the Las Vegas massacre. Um, I'll just take a second to note that the Supreme Court in uh, 2024, just a few months ago, ruled in Cargill versus Garland that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives incorrectly, according to the court, in, um, interpreted the federal ban on machine guns to apply to bump stocks. The court unhelpfully suggested that Congress, if it so deemed, could ban bump stocks. Um, this, of course, this decision is part of an ongoing attack on the administrative state by the court, um, but that's a subject for another day. The reformist logic employs protest and traditional political activity, and these are the parts of the movement that receive the most public attention, the most media attention, and I would argue the most scholarly attention as well. Even within social movement research and increased focus on culture, uh, other kinds of strategies tend to be ignored. So let's talk about the actual scope of gun violence. What does gun violence in the United States look like? Um, on average, there are about 44,341 deaths per year from gun violence in the U.S. Um, in addition, over 200 people are shot per and wounded per day. That translates to over 73,000. So together, we're talking about almost 120,000 people shot and killed or wounded by a gun in the United States annually. Gun violence is also a problem of gender. Women in the U.S. are 28 more time, times more likely to be killed by a gun um, than women in other high-income countries. Every month, an average of 70 women in the U.S. are shot and killed by an intimate partner, and many more are shot and wounded. Nearly one million women um, in the U.S. today have had a gun used against them by an intimate partner, and over four and a half million women in the U.S. today report having been threatened with a gun by an intimate partner. Access to a weapon, access to a gun, makes a woman five times more likely that she will be killed than if there's no gun in the house. Suicide by firearm constitutes the largest proportion of gun deaths in the U.S. at 57%. This is a national tragedy. So contrary to our image of terrified children and teens racing away from their school buildings, gun violence is overwhelmingly a problem that decimates black and brown communities. Gun violence is racialized despite the most common headline-grabbing images of gun violence. Black Americans represent the majority of gun homicide victims. They're 12 times more likely than white Americans to die by gun homicide. And this doesn't count the over 70,000 who are shot and wounded each year. The majority of the neighborhoods that are characterized by high rates of poverty, racial segregation and discrimination, and many other deep-rooted systemic and structural inequalities. According to the Gun Violence Archive, uh, 1,442 people were killed by police in 2023. Um, the, the data on the slide comes from every time for gun safety. I think that the Gun Violence Archive is probably a little bit more accurate. Um, every time reports 576 people. And according to the Gun Violence Archive, 656 people were killed in mass shootings in 2023. So when we actually look at the numbers, um, gun violence, the, the demography of gun violence, if you will, looks very different than uh, the way that it's presented in popular discourse and by the media. Um, so, racist meaning structures clearly shape whose lives are given value by the media and who gets the attention and who doesn't. Um, in terms of the lack of attention to um, the killing of black and brown people in poor communities, racist meaning structures um, often blame the victims for their own victimization. And this is a product of racist discourse, um, whose lives matter, and whose deaths are deserving of outrage. 
Now, the tragedy of gun suicide also doesn't get a lot of media or public attention, but when it does, it's marshaled in several pernicious ways. Conservatives and the gun lobby use the fact that the majority of gun deaths are from suicide to claim that gun violence is a problem of suicide, and by extension, they claim mental illness, even if this is not factually based. Um, there is not really good statistics to say that, in fact, people with mental illness are more likely to die by suicide. Um, the focus on gun suicide is also used as a way to distract from the broader problem of guns and gun violence. In fact, limiting access to guns is quite effective at reducing the rates of suicide. Safely storing guns, even creating a slight delay between the impulse to die by suicide and the time that you have access to the means by doing so, can actually derail a suicide attempt. And so stronger gun laws actually do reduce the suicide rate, despite the way that it's marshaled in the media and also by the gun lobby. Um, focusing on gun deaths, because so much of the public conversation is on gun deaths, rather than the, and, and forgetting about those who survive their gun injuries, is also problematic. Um, suicide by firearm is far more likely to be completed than suicide by other means. And increasingly, as protocols for treating gunshot victims improve, survival rates also increase. Just as one example, in Philadelphia, the police no longer call, when the police are called to the scene of a shooting, they no longer call, they call an ambulance. Instead, the protocol now is just to pile them in the back of the police cruiser. Um, I met several residents at Temple University Hospital who told me that night after night, they literally are pulling bleeding bodies out of the back seats of police cars. Um, what this means, though, is that the survival rate increases. It doesn't mean that the damage done by gun violence is any less. Um, and so it behooves us not to forget about the hundreds of thousands of people living with the ongoing physical and psychological trauma related to their gunshot injuries. And forgetting about those people contributes to skewing the public conversation on reducing gun violence and also risks that we focus on the wrong solutions. The media, um, so in addition to the incomplete picture of gun violence, there's a misunderstanding of the movement itself. So I distinguish between gun control and gun violence prevention. The term gun control was once used a lot by the movement in these earlier um, within the Beltway organizations, but it's really a relic of the past and it's also shaped by the discourse of the media and by the gun lobby. Um, it reflects the movement to change laws and policies, the safe hands, safe guns framing, and really the reformist arm of the movement. I use the term gun violence prevention. It's the term that's used by activists, and it better reflects the goals of the activists, and especially the activism of those who are typically left out of dominant conversations, people who focus on addressing root causes and prevention and intervention. And finally, even the reformist logic of the gun violence prevention movement sees itself as reducing gun violence, not controlling guns per se. The two kinds of gun violence I'm going to focus on today are community gun violence and mass shootings. Um, I define community gun violence as violence produced by the conditions of racialized urban disadvantage, segregation, concentrated poverty, lack of access to jobs, quality education, and other services, as well as crime control strategies that produce mass incarceration, all of which are the legacy of systemic racism. Mass shootings are defined by every town for gun safety as an incident in which four or more people, not including the shooter, are killed with a firearm. When we talk about racist meaning structures or these background structures of cultural meaning, there are three that I focus on that overlap considerably. Um, the first is the discourse of black criminality and of white innocence. This assumption that um, you know, black folks must inherently be criminal or somehow responsible for their own victimization and that white people are uh, naturally innocent. Um, controlling images, Patricia Hill Collins, and also the discourse of worthiness and value as uh, discussed by Brian Stingsland. All of these discourses shape what the public knows about gun violence and gun violence prevention, the experience of gun violence, how we understand activism, and how we research gun violence. Finally, and most importantly, it affects how we think about solving the problem of gun violence. 
Racist meaning systems shape and determine the media representations which affect what the public knows. 24, a 24 year old black man from Brooklyn, New York, was shot and killed at 1.30 a.m. outside of Poppy's Pizza Bar in Hamden, Connecticut. This quote is just one example of how the media covers the death of black and brown people. Such coverage appears in the police blotters of the paper, if it appears at all, and it's emblematic of the media's underlying assumptions about whose lives have value. Reverend Odell Montgomery Cooper, the mother of Jonathan, who was referenced in this quote, is an activist with the group Do Not Stand I May Buy, which is part of Connect, Congregations for New Connecticut. Her son, Jonathan, was shot and killed in a case of mistaken identity. Reverend Cooper fought the New Haven Register um, so that they would cover him as a complete person in the way they would if he had been white. Um, she and others from Connect and Do Not Stand Idly By advocated for the removal of um, the liver license from Poppy's Pizza. Uh, the real name of Poppy's was Sliced Pizza, but in her book she calls it Poppy's. Um, and that campaign pushed um, Slice out of business once their liquor license was removed. And the pizza place itself had been notorious as a site of rampant drug dealing and gun violence. Uh, people in the neighborhood at public hearings reported sometimes putting their children on the weekend, putting their children to sleep in their bathtubs so that if a stray bullet came through the wall, it would not kill them. So racist meaning structures um, also shape the experience of gun violence. Mrs. Davis, one of the leaders of Mothers United Against Gun Violence, whose son was shot and killed in Hartford, told me in our interview, and so I felt that it was something that showed up as a defect on moms or on me initially. I think that happens to a lot of black and brown moms across the board and a lot of families across the board. It happens. So it's not just me, because I hear that a lot. Moms are saying, oh my god, what did I do? What did I do? And typically, obviously, we always say, you didn't do anything wrong. You did everything right. In this heartbreaking quote, Mrs. Davis expresses concern that she is to blame for her son's murder. In her role as a leader of Mothers United Against Violence, um, she hears the same concern regularly from mothers she and MUAV support after the gunshot deaths of a loved one in Hartford. In my seven years of being involved in the movement, I have never heard anything similar from my victims of mass shootings to compare to this. It simply does not exist in that community. So the double whammy of the discourse of black criminality coupled with a gendered belief that it's the mom's job to protect her children and her fault if something goes wrong shape the experience of victims of community gun violence. Another activist I spoke with described to me what happened in the months following the shooting of her nine-year-old son in the West Indian Day Parade in Hartford. She told me this after describing how she spent three months in the hospital at her little boy's bedside as he fought for his life. She noted, no one really came to check on us. No one, after he was plastered over the national news the first couple of days after the week it was over. And the only reason they even got any coverage was because he was shot in such a public place. Um, she said, I felt the story was done. Everyone got their ratings, and you guys are left to, your, to this underground. We got no help, not from nobody in the city, no mayor, nobody, nothing. Uh, she continued, she said, my employer did end up paying me like my short-term disability, my long-term disability, and then after everything was exhausted, it was pretty much like, come clean out your desk. We can't hold your job anymore. And yes, I had a desire to go back to work. I was working at that insurance company, Hartford's a big insurance town. Um, I had been there for five years. I was making good money. I was able to financially take care of myself and my children and save money. So when that happened, I exhausted all my savings. I wanted to go back, but I just couldn't. He was getting homeschooled. He hadn't had the skull replacement yet. He had to wear a helmet. It was just a lot. I had to care for him 24 hours a day. There were things that he couldn't do because he has no movement of the left arm, and he was walking with a limp because he was walking with a cane because he had to learn to walk all over again. So it was either go to work and neglect my son or stay here and take care of my son and try to survive another way. And I was almost homeless after all of this. I mean, it was a lot, but we pushed through. We got through it. I exhausted all my savings. I ended up collecting unemployment for a little while. 
I ended up getting my CNA license. That was the quickest thing I knew I could do to jump into a different field. So for years, groups like Mothers United Against Violence try to um, help wherever they can, often out of their own pockets. And these folks don't have a lot of money themselves, and there's little ability, if any, to actually support the needs of the ongoing needs of survivors. So in addition to the reformist logic, uh, which is aimed at changing laws and policies, I also identify interventionist logic. And this is the type of organizing that generally escapes the radar of the study of violence prevention activism. The intervention logic seeks to interrupt violence at the individual, community, and institutional and structural levels while also challenging systems of cultural meaning. Rather than focus on state on the state large institutions, intervention organizations often stem from more direct community-led approaches, addressing their public and supporters directly, rather than through media outlets. Activities directed at individual and community levels to reduce gun violence include street-level mediation and violence interruption, hospital-based violence intervention and prevention programs, meeting with high-risk youth, outreach to community members, public messaging, education, um, post-shooting responses, vigils, rallies, and marches, working with community and faith-based faith -based organizations. Um, and in addition to these strategies in my research, they also really work to support and provide structure for youth and create informal social safety nets. Um, organizations employing interventionist logic in Connecticut long predate Sandy Hook. While they occasionally gain some local coverage, for the most part they fly below the public radar and have not, until recently, perhaps significantly affected public discourse. There are three main types of um, intervention programs aimed at reducing uh, community gun violence. Uh, and these are the most prominent and these are the ones that are most studied. And generally they're studied by criminologists rather than as part of the broader social movement. Um, and I would argue instead that they actually should be considered part of the ecology of gun violence prevention activism when one is looking at community gun violence prevention. Um, in one way or another, these organizations all work with, they work to identify those who are most at risk of committing gun violence because those are the same folks who are also most at risk of being a victim of gun, of gun violence and they work to address the underlying health needs of those individuals. Some groups address youth, some address young adults, and other organizations work with the re-entry community, people returning from incarceration. Many of these groups really work to reduce retaliation, racing to hospitals when someone is shot in order to prevent further violence. Some work directly with schools to identify those most at risk in order to intervene before violence is committed. The main difference between focused deterrence and the cure violence and HDIP approaches is that um, focused deterrence also uses the threat of increased policing and surveillance, whereas the cure violence approaches don't do that. Um, a complete discussion of that, of these programs, is beyond the scope of my talk today, um, but all of these kinds of organizations exist in Connecticut. Um, there are hospital violence intervention programs at Yale New Haven Hospital, at St. Francis Hospital in, Hart in Hartford, and there are numerous community, um, cure violence organizations in um, both Hartford, Bridgeport, and New Haven. In addition to these more formal and larger scale, uh oh, do we lose? There we go. <laughs> um, in addition to these larger, oh, you don't, nobody like that because you don't like my photo. Um, <laughs> uh, so, in, adi um, in addition to the larger scale organizations, there uh, also are sidewalk vigils that are um, engaged in by groups like Mothers United Against Violence. They hold these vigils um, within a few days of the deadly shooting at the very place where somebody was shot and killed. Um, in the first 15 years of Mothers United's existence, from 2003 to 2018, they held close to 500 vigils, mirroring the number of people killed by a gun in Hartford. Once a year, they hold an annual march and at the march, they have, well, over the years, they construct a white cross with the names and the dates of birth and death. Um, oops. No. No, that's it. All right, we're good. Hopefully. 
hopefully that stands in. Um, sorry, I get a little off track here. Uh, anyhow, so at, the, at these annual marches, um, they have you know, about 500 crosses, um, and, which unfortunately the number goes up each and every year. Um, and they don't even have enough marchers so that each person carries one cross. So when I go on to those marches, you, know, you carry four or five um, crosses as many as you can, and then the rest they just put in buckets and they transfer those to the end of the march. Um, calls to action of sidewalk vigils include ending economic and social injustice, linked to institutional racism and segregation, taking community responsibility for reducing gun violence, which can include fostering better relations with the police um, to help reduce the gun violence that plagues racially oppressed communities. It's simply you know, weird to go. Uh, <laughs> uh, this calls to action to find the intervention logic focusing on changes in individual community and structural levels and challenging racist cultural meaning systems that devalue black and brown lives, in addition to changing community practices to create and foster more efficacy. What do you think in the back? Response could not be more different. 
Mayor Mann, a school librarian at Sandy Hook Elementary, who huddled in the closet with 18 nine-year-olds at Sandy Hook during the shooting, described to me the outpouring of sympathy, support, and love to Newtown following the tragedy. She told me, first of all, the community got, um, the Newtown got eight zillion gifts. We literally rented a giant warehouse to put the gifts in. I mean, 25,000 teddy bears and 20 truckloads of snowflakes and school supplies. 10,000 books. I mean, you know, crazy stuff coming in. People wanting to help. Every kind of mental health, legitimate or wacky, that you could imagine trying to come in and provide support. To understand the differences in response, we just need to think back to the mother who was isolated and forgotten as she lost her job and nearly became homeless because she was caring for her little boy who had been shot and back and injured. In the context of my research, I never heard families of mass shooting victims express the guilt and drive to prove the worthiness of their loved ones in the way that Mrs. Davis described her own experiences and that of the other mothers of Mothers United Against Violence. Um, so the response by the media and the public could not be more different. Connecticut also responded to Sandy Hook um, in quite a different way. Um, than in response to community gun violence. Politicians rushed to the scene. Therapists were dispatched to the schools. Um, community gun violence activists talk about something in the poor urban communities called yellow tape syndrome, where their kids are used to seeing yellow tape and the psychological and trauma that that gives them. You know, nobody is sending legions of therapists to their schools. Um, Connecticut found the money to build a new school in Newtown, despite the fact that the budget was supposedly strapped. Um, they also passed a comprehensive set of state laws in Connecticut in response to the Sandy Hook shooting to address um, particularly school shootings. Um, there's a saying among many activists who I know that it is when um, a white child dies, you get a law. When a black child dies, you get nothing. So watching in the wings as um, you know, the aftermath of Sandy Hook unfolded, black activists like Frank, who directed Connecticut's Project Longevity, told me in our interview, so when Columbine happened, we were like, okay, so it's a big deal now, right? But this has been going on in the inner city for years, so for us, it's different. It's just that corporate media is talking about it. If you come from certain communities like I used to hang out on Woodlock Avenue in the Bronx. That's where Avenue Diallo was shot, right? I'm talking a couple of weeks before we got shot, right? So for us, it's not like anything new. Even something like a school shooting is not new if you're from New York or Baltimore or Chicago. People got shot in our high schools in the 90s. Going to my high school is worse than you guys coming in through the security thing here. Um, Brent worked in a federal building, so we had to go through some security just to get into the building um, to do an interview. Uh, uh, so he said, you know, not only did our book bags and stuff have to go through the x-ray machine, we also had to walk through the door, and we were also wanted and patted down in some cases. That was high school for me. And just to note, and for those of you who are old enough to remember Adam Dujalo, he was shot and killed um, as he was entering his own apartment building in the Bronx by police who shot him multiple times uh, in, because they were looking for a black suspect. Um, and Columbine happened on April 20th, so you know, a little over a month after um, Amadou Diallo was shot. So black and brown activists we spoke with um, generally echo the same sentiments about the Sandy Hook tragedy, horror at the tragedy, and anger that their grief was not honored in the same way. And the country did, at least briefly, um, consider gun violence to be a big deal after Sandy Hook. President Obama came to Connecticut following the tragedy, and he cried over the deaths of young children, little more than babies who had been murdered. Many activists described how meaningful the president's genuine expression of grief was to them. Vice President Biden came to Connecticut and met with Sandy Hook families and with people from urban communities who lost loved ones to community gun violence. Pastor Sam Saylor, whose son Shane was shot and killed in Hartford about a month before Sandy Hook, described the meeting to me. So we're boiling over in this room for five hours, you know, wondering what's going on in the other room and why are we split up. So um, about around five hours.
hours. Vice President Biden came over, and after we went around the room, and we we were just explaining our um, our pain to each other. And as an organizer, I tried to organize the room. Right? I knew that the Secret Service was either in the room or had a or had a tape in our room because Vice President Biden didn't come in until it seemed like everything was calm. People had got their opinions, emotions out. So when he came in, he sat at the head of the table. Um, and he wanted to do introductions, and people introduced themselves. And my son's mom got to tell the story of Shane. Um, when it got to me, I said, "Well, you know, Vice President Biden, thank you for coming in. I don't want to retell the same story, but I wanted to tell you that even though people are very polite now because you're in the room, um, because there's a lot of undercurrent of anger boiling in here, because we feel like we're a footnote. We feel like we're footnoted." in a subject that we've been the star of for years, and now it seems like you, go, you guys only think that gun violence happens and trauma happens right here. Um, and we feel really offended um, and really upset, and we're feeling like we're a footnote. And he, sat, um, and he sits back in his chair, and he says with his cups in his hand, um, he has the room, and he said, you are. Um, and I make a surprised face, raising my eyebrows, and he says, oh, um, he says, that's, what, that's exactly what we do with the eyebrows, oh. Um, and he said, uh, until 20 little white babies died in an almost all-white town, we were trying to bring up gun violence in Washington, the whole of Washington, and they all laugh at us while, um, while they give us the finger, or won't even, um, or won't even entertain us. They are pretending to care. Now the door has been cracked. Not wide open, but the door is cracked for gun advocates to at least pretend that we're being heard. And we need to get that door open, and we need you to help us push that door open. But it didn't get cracked, cracked until 20 little white babies died. So I'm sort of fast forward here. Um, you can you know, read other work uh, but that, that I'm working on right now. But what happened? What was this? What was the Sandy Cup effect? Um, so Sandy Cup, I argue, set off um, a long chain of events that I trace out in greater detail elsewhere. The massacre raised the profile of gun violence as an issue, created a new generation of activists who began to learn about one another, and that rippled across communities and states snowballing into a large-scale movement. There was also direct political impact. On the day of the Standing Cup shooting, Congressional Representative Chris Murphy, who represented Newtown and was about to be sworn in as the junior senator from Connecticut, rushed to the scene. Senator Murphy would go on to become one of the country's staunchest champions for gun violence prevention, along with Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal, as would then Vice President Biden, who eventually, as president, the most significant national legislation to prevent gun violence in decades, which addressed all kinds of gun violence. There was also an organizational impact, which was profound. Out of the wreckage of Sandy Hook Elementary School and the streets of Connecticut's urban areas emerged myriad collaborations between new white suburban activists and community gun violence activists. The National Gun Violence Prevention Roundtable, which is a weekly um, phone call for all um, any kind of organization dedicated to preventing gun violence um, and shift strategies and goals. Um, that started after Sandy Hook. New organizations sprang up, um, existing organizations expanded, receiving both an influx of contributions from volunteers, personal journeys and connections across lines of difference formed. And I want to be clear, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to paint a, a very a too rosy picture here. Tensions and gaps between fears and reality between how good problems are identified, the strategies deployed, and the solutions that are proposed continue to be fraught. Yet if we fast forward to the present, I want to leave us with both words of hope and words of caution. In my work with the statewide organization Connecticut Against Gun Violence, I conducted a series of listening sessions with the communities most impacted by gun violence in New Haven as part of a project to develop a blueprint for a city office of gun violence prevention. 
Residents describe the deterioration of their neighborhoods in contradistinction to the areas in which Yale faculty and students live. They lamented the loss of well-paying industrial jobs, the disappearance of community centers that provided youth activities, the ongoing experience with gun violence, and the terror that gun violence might strike their children or friends and loved ones, the disinvestment in their communities. And I would add that um, the overwhelming majority of our listening session participants already have experience with gun violence, with losing friends and family. Um, neighbors, one woman described um, someone being shot at the bottom of her driveway, a stranger, and she, she literally held him as he bled to death. Um, residents participated in the listening sessions in the hopes that New Haven would engage in comprehensive efforts to improve neighborhoods and to address the root causes of violence. As one listening participant said, millionaires don't shoot each other in the street. People with broke futures don't kill each other. People with nothing to lose kill each other. I think that if we didn't have the economic inequity that we have, then things would improve markedly. Whether or not the new Office of Gun Violence Prevention will begin to address the systemic legacy of racism that shapes the experiences and life chances of community members is anyone's guess. On my more cynical days, I despair that such a transformation will ever come to pass. On my more hopeful days, I look across the country and nationally, and I see the creation of city, state, and the National Office of Gun Violence Prevention. By the way, it's been headed up by Vice President Harris. Um, I see more people learning about and caring about impoverished communities such as Hartford and New Haven and Bridgeport and similar cities across the country. My hope is that these efforts will address root causes, coordinate responses across multiple organizations, both large and small, that they will work with places to divert at-risk folks away from the criminal justice system toward community-based organizations that can help, that the most dangerous offenders will be removed from communities, that they will provide support for second-chance citizens. In short, I hope that they work to address the underlying causes of community gun violence that stem from the legacy of systemic racism, the lack of economic and educational opportunities, disenfranchisement, segregation, a lack of activities for youth, despair, and warrior policing. Otherwise, even if we provide services for those most at risk and are able to divert them from committing violence, we have not addressed the root causes of gun violence in the first place. We must stop the violence, but we must simultaneously address the conditions that foster violence in the first place. In 2022, Congress passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. In 2023, President Biden established the first ever White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Connecticut established a state commission on gun violence prevention, which in turn has funded some local offices, including the Office of Violence Prevention in Hartford, which is now being funded from general funds from the legislature as opposed to from one-time ARPA money. But I also worry. Reducing the flow of illegal guns, especially the iron pipeline, can make conflict less deadly. Investing in community and in mental health professionals and schools who can identify at-risk youth and provide them and their families with services and thus reduce the school to prison pipeline and the negative health effects of poverty and exposure to violence. Investing in intervention and prevention organizations to reduce retaliation and provide alternative means of conflict resolution is critical. Supporting survivors through the Victims of Crime Act or BOCA funds can ensure that survivors receive the help they so desperately need to be resilient. All of these are critical parts of ending the scourge of gun violence in black and brown communities. Thomas Act argues that in order to rebuild communities, we need to stop the violence in hot spot areas, that is, the areas where most gun violence takes place, and that reducing the violence may promote investment in those communities so that they can thrive. My fear is that we will rely solely on the interventionist logic. If we do, it's just putting band-aids on the problem. It's as if these programs are pulling people out of the water as they are drowning, rather than looking at why they're falling into the water in the first place and why they can't swim. We must invest in communities, we must invest in interventionist and prevention organizations, but that must be done in conjunction with anti-poverty work and in disenfranchisement and punitive criminal justice policies that exacerbate rather than improve community safety and efficacy. To do that, we must all challenge the cultural discourses that are used to justify leaving these communities behind. It's a big lift, but it has to be done if we 